Lord God, I thank you so much for this opportunity to come together with my brothers and sisters, my family, and I just pray that as we open up your word, as we go into a time of just learning about you, that your Holy Spirit will speak to our hearts, open our minds, and and uh, just uh, teach us something new that can help us to serve you better. We love you. You're awesome. Amen. All right, well, today's message is called Lord of All. And this is a standalone message. It's not part of a series or anything like that. And it examines the biblical, theological, and practical understanding of the Lordship of Jesus. Um, You guys have probably heard people use the phrase, Jesus is Lord. You've probably seen it on a t-shirt or two uh, and that sort of thing. But basically, that's the whole message in three words. Um, Jesus is Lord. Um, If you're taking notes, uh, you can write that down and you pretty much have the whole message. Um, But because we're already here, um, we'll go ahead and unpack that a little bit and and, uh, discuss it a little bit further. But what we want to talk about today is how Jesus is not just a means to heaven, right? We don't just embrace Jesus and call ourselves a Christian so that we uh, don't uh, uh, go to hell or whatever. You know, people uh, joke around about uh, Jesus and uh, salvation and being a Christian as fire insurance. Have you guys ever heard that? Um, it's, it's ridiculous because that's not what it's about. Jesus is Lord. And so our walk with Jesus is not simply a personal spiritual feeling. It's not uh, about just coming here on a Sunday morning and singing some songs and feeling some warm, fuzzy feelings and then going about our way. Rather, it should reflect Uh, It should influence and impact every aspect of our life. Everything that we do, everything that we are, should be impacted if we are a Christian, if we're a believer. It should affect the ethic by which we live out each and every single day of our life. Uh, Let me say that one more time. Our walk with Jesus is not simply a personal, spiritual feeling that we have. Rather, it should influence and impact every aspect of our life and the ethic by which we live out each and every day. Now, I know that that is kind of wordy. It has alliteration. (laughs) It's uh, uh, very punchy, and uh, it, it sounds crazy. It's pretty intense. But all it means is that if Jesus is Lord of our life, he should be Lord of our life in everything that that means. And so I want to I want to start off uh, kind of elaborating on that by reading Romans 14 uh, verses two through nine. It says this, for instance, one person believes it's all right to eat anything, but another believer with a sensitive conscience uh, will eat only vegetables. Those who feel free to eat anything must not look down on those who don't, and those who don't eat certain foods must not condemn those who do, for God has accepted them. Who are you to condemn someone else's servants? Their own master or Lord will judge whether they stand or fall. And with the Lord's help, they will stand and receive his approval. In the same way, some think one day is more holy than another day, while others think every day is alike. You should each be fully convinced that whichever day you choose is acceptable. Those who worship the Lord on a special day do it to honor Him. Those who eat any kind of food do it to honor the Lord, since they give thanks to God before eating. And those who refuse to eat certain uh, foods also want to please the Lord and give thanks to God. For we don't live our lives or die for, we don't live for ourselves or die for ourselves. If we live, it's to honor the Lord. And if we die, it's to honor the Lord. So whether we live or die, we belong to the Lord. Christ died and rose again for this very purpose, to be Lord, both of the living and the dead. And, and, and that's really the, the, the crux of all of this, is that Christ died and rose again for this very purpose, to be the Lord of both the living and the dead. Christ rose, uh, uh, he died and rose again because he's the Lord. 
right? And uh, just a side note, the beginning part of that scripture is something that we kind of touched on a couple weeks ago uh, when it's talking about the eating certain things and the worshiping on certain days. These uh, actions in themselves are morally neutral. Uh, What's important is that God cares about our hearts, He cares about our intentions. He cares about our motivations. He cares about our inspirations. What's behind those actions? He cares about why we're doing what we're doing. Because sometimes you can do the right thing for the wrong reason, and you can do the wrong thing for the right reason, right? (laughs) Sometimes we come into this place and we do all the right actions, but maybe our heart's not right. Have you ever worshiped the Lord, raised your hands, clapped, sang the words up on the screen, but you were filled with anger because of something that happened uh, earlier on that day or or something like that? I mean, uh, this is the example that I I often use, and I'm sure you've all heard it at least once if you've you've heard me speak before. But uh, if I push you down violently and you skin your knee and you're hurt, and I do it because I'm angry at you, that's a, uh, a, a violent action, but also my intentions are evil, right? I'm trying to hurt you because I'm angry. I'm, I'm sinning in my anger. But the exact same scenario, I push you violently out of the path of a, a speeding bus, <laughs> then that violent action, that same exact action, is good and morally right because I was saving your life. And the same thing is true with us in every action that we do throughout the day. Our intention matters. Why we do something matters. And uh, we're going to get into what that means uh, in the context of Jesus being Lord. In his commentary about uh, the book of Romans, uh, Kenneth Boa writes this, Paul's statement that confessing Jesus is Lord, along with believing, has given rise to the term lordship salvation. This is a view that there is only one Christ, one that is both Savior and Lord, and that a believer cannot accept Christ as Savior without also submitting to his lordship as well. In this view, a Christian and a disciple are synonymous, not separate. Also, spiritual growth and maturity is a sign of new life. And if there is no growth or maturity, it is evidence of the absence of life. Boa explains that this viewpoint is uh, an older view that a person can become a Christian simply on the basis of belief in facts of Christ's life, death, and resurrection without any change in their life or outward manifestation. And that is actually a newer view. He adds that in the United States, variations of this view have been popularized in the 20th century primarily by people who are concerned with front-loading the gospel with the conditions of discipleship. Now that's kind of wordy again, but let me break it down for you. Basically, that just means that there needs to be a balance uh, when we are acknowledging the lordship and the authority of Jesus. Uh, and then, but if we're not willing to actually surrender, you know, what does it mean to be a lord? It means to be in charge. It means that if you're underneath someone's lordship, that you serve them, right? And, and sometimes we, we get uh, worried that if we explain what it really means to be a Christian, that we have to sacrifice ourselves and we have to deny ourselves and we have to give ourselves to Jesus as our Lord, that it'll scare people off, right? We, we see too many churches these days and too many pastors and preachers and evangelists that they just want to make everything sound so easy. You just have to do this. It's so easy. Listen, here is what you have to do. It's just this one little thing, right? Um, we've talked about this before here. You know, you have an altar call and, and, and uh, you're basically begging people to come forward and, and all you have to do is come up here and re- you don't even have to say your own prayer. Just repeat these words after me and then, and then uh, you'll, you'll just, everything will be great. And that, there's part of that that's true. You know, we know that Jesus is the Savior. We know that he died for our sins, that his work on the cross was complete, 100%. It has nothing to do with us. 
all we do is accept his uh, gracious gift of mercy, right? We can all agree. Jesus did the work. Salvation is only because of him. But when we get saved, when we are converted, when we are forgiven, when we are washed clean, when we are given a new heart, we are made a new creation, then we also make him our Lord. He is our Savior and he's our Lord. And when Jesus is our Lord, it means something. It means that we take up our cross daily. It means that we must crucify our flesh, that we must deny ourselves. It means that we must serve Him. You have a Lord and you have servants. We are Christ's servants if He is our Lord. But how many of you guys know that in our culture, we do not like to bend the knee for anyone? We have a running joke at my house (laughs) because I joke often (laughs) about doing whatever I want. And my wife teases me about it because I'll park somewhere and she'll be like, I don't think this is a parking spot. I don't think you can park here. And my response is always the same. Nobody tells me what to do. (laughs) I halfway mean it (laughs) because obviously in my life, lots of people tell me what to do. (laughs) But when it comes to us, In Western culture, good, individualistic, freedom-loving Americans, we don't like to be told what to do. And when it comes to being a Christian, how many of you know that that's the exact opposite? (laughs) That we are supposed to surrender 100% to Jesus. If he is truly our Lord, we are truly his servants. And so we have to remember that. Uh, I wanted to read... um, Colossians 1, 15 through 17. This has been a a portion of scripture that I've just been reading over and over and over because it just speaks to the lordship of Jesus and it just blows me away every time I read it. I I read it, you know, several times in the first service and, and every time it was like, wow. It's like as if I had never read it before. But this is what it says. Christ is the visible image of the invisible God. He existed before anything, was created, and is supreme over all creation. For through him, God created everything in the heavenly realms and on earth. He made the things we can see and the things we can't see, such as thrones, kingdoms, rulers, and authorities in the unseen world. Everything was created through him and for him. He existed before anything else, and he holds all creation together. I mean, if that doesn't get your blood flowing about who Jesus is, I don't know what would, because that is awesome. I mean, when we bend the knee to Jesus and we uh, accept his gift of salvation and then we rise up as his servant to serve him, that is something awesome. It's something amazing. Uh, I, I think, though, because of the culture we live in, we, we, we think of it wrongly. It's such an amazing honor to serve him. Um, We see throughout the whole New Testament that Jesus is Lord of all creation. And believers, once they accept that salvation, that gift of salvation, they enter into a life-giving relationship that should be changing every aspect of our life. But I think because we uh, get only half the message that we have people coming up to the altar and saying the magic words and then going back and realizing what? This world hasn't changed at all. Yeah, because that's not how salvation works. (laughs) Your world doesn't change, you do. (laughs) And then it's your job to go into the world and change the world on behalf of Jesus with the help of his Holy Spirit. I mean, can you imagine? You go and you give your heart to the Lord on Sunday, and Monday morning you wake up and you still got to go to your crappy job and deal with your mean boss, right? The same people on Sunday that lived in your house (laughs) still live there on Monday, That's not what changes when we give our heart to the Lord, when we make him Lord of our life. 
Jesus being Lord means something for us. So our application or our challenge uh, for today for this message is this. We must not limit our walk with Jesus to certain parts of our life, but we need to make Him Lord of every part. We, we hold on to stuff. <laughs> you know, we must not limit our walk. If He is Lord, He is Lord. Have you ever negotiated for something that you wanted? Maybe uh, you're getting a new job and you're, you're negotiating your contract. Or maybe you lo- like to go to uh, garage sales and haggle the price down. Um, whatever it might be, we tend to negotiate for things in life that we want. You know, um, we, might, uh, we might have the same idea when it comes to our relationship with Jesus. We, we try to hold on to certain things. We say, you know what? I accept your salvation. You are my Savior. You are my Lord. I am your servant. I'm crying out to you, maker of the universe. You can have everything except for this little thing right here. This is mine. I'm going to hold on to that. I'm going to put it over here where you can't really see it because you wouldn't really like it. I mean, isn't that how we are? We're like, man, I give so much. I give 72.3% of myself to Jesus. (laughs) I give a full 81.9% on the weekends because I go to church for a whole hour. We tend to hold back certain parts, but if he is Lord of all, then he is Lord of all, right? Uh, Author Bruce Ashford in his book, Every Square Inch, an, an introduction to culture engagement for Christians, says this of Colossians 1, 15 through 17, quote, we do this, as a matter of obedience. If Christ is the creator of everything, then we must realize that his lordship is as wide as creation. Nothing in this universe escapes his lordship. And if his lordship is as wide as creation, then our obedience to his lordship must be as wide as our culture. The call to be disciples of Christ is the call to bring absolutely every square inch of the fabric of our lives under his lordship, unquote. Let me say that last line one more time. The call to be disciples of Christ is the call to bring absolutely every square inch of fabric of our lives under His Lordship. Another familiar example that we can relate to is, you've probably heard uh, some people say, it's all or nothing. You know, in or out. You're with us or you're against us, whatever whatever it might be. But it's the all or nothing attitude. We must be very careful uh, putting too large of an emphasis on either or or all or nothing thinking um, uh, when we're applying it to certain areas of our life. And those certain areas tend to be with other people. You know, with other people, it can't be either or, all or nothing, or else it can lead to brokenness and bitterness. We, we read the first scripture that we read in Romans. Um, you may recall we were talking about certain people not looking down on these other people because they had a different belief. They thought that one way of eating was proper and one uh, day to worship on was proper. And it was saying that, you know, it's bigger than that, that we all have to get along. You know, the whole, uh, the whole New Testament is full of, of talking about loving one another and, and finding true unity and working together. And uh, we need to remember that it's not all or nothing when we're dealing with other people. Um, one area that I can think of that would be a good example of this is uh, politics. How many of you guys know that we don't all agree on everything? (laughs) But listen, we're all under the lordship of Jesus Christ. And so we can't say all or nothing with one another when it comes to disagreeing on certain perspectives. We need to focus on it being all or nothing under the lordship of Jesus Christ. We should absolutely and completely follow Jesus with everything, all or nothing. Throughout the New Testament, the lordship of Jesus is assumed and it's emphasized. Uh, 
Paul tells the Roman church in Romans 14, 7 through 9, uh, and we, we read this, that's the portion I was just making reference to, but I just want to reread the, the end of it. It says, For we don't live for ourselves or die for ourselves. If we live, it's to the honor of the Lord. And if we die, it's to honor the Lord. So whether we live or die, we belong to the Lord. Christ died and rose again for this very purpose, to be Lord, both to the living and of the dead. It's all or nothing. Once we've made him Lord of our life, he's either Lord or he's not. He's either Lord of all or he's Lord of nothing. The Lexham Context uh, Commentary of the New Testament has this to say about this passage. Quote, For God's new covenant people, Paul redefines the marker of holiness as a life lived in and for Christ. Verses 7 through 8 point out that as followers of Christ, believers no longer belong to themselves. This reality sh uh, should reorient all of one's behaviors. All of our behaviors should be influenced by the fact that we are under the lordship of Jesus. Uh, in verse 9, Paul reminds his audience of their fundamental allegiance to the lordship of Christ. Christ's universal lordship takes precedence over cultural divisions. We're all very different, right? We all come from different backgrounds. We all interpret certain scriptures a different way. We're never, ever, ever going to agree on everything. But the one thing that we can agree on is Jesus is Lord. And we are all under His Lordship. And that takes precedence over any divisions that we have. That's how true unity works. True unity is not agreeing on everything. True unity is working together and loving one another when we don't agree on anything. Have you ever noticed that some of the biggest proponents of tolerance tend to not tolerate anybody that doesn't think exactly like them? <laughs> if you don't disagree, you don't need to tolerate anything. <laughs> if you agree on everything, then you just agree on everything. We need to make sure that we're putting the Lord first and that that takes precedence despite our differences. Paul also uh, writes in a familiar passage of Romans 10, uh, 9 and 10 this, If you openly declare that, the Lord, uh, that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For it is by believing in your heart that you are made right with God. And it is by openly declaring your faith that you are saved. Again, we are saved by the work that Jesus did on the cross. All we have to do is believe it and declare it. That's it. But if we make him Lord, there's going to be signs. You see all those memes, right? <laughs> if I ever win the lottery, I won't say anything, but there will be signs, right? <laughs> well, when we serve the Lord, there should be signs. People should know there's something different. There's something different about this person, you know? As we read in uh, Colossians 1, 15 through 17, uh, he declares the power and majesty of, of uh, Christ as Lord. And, and like I said, I want to read that again because it's just so awesome. Christ is the visible image of the invisible God. He existed before anything was created and is supreme over all creation. For through him, God created everything in the heavenly realms and on the earth. He made the things we can see and the things we can't see, such as thrones, kingdoms, rulers, and authorities in the unseen world. Everything was created through him and for him. He existed before anything else, and he holds all creation together. Again, quoting author, uh, author uh, Bruce Ashford, he says, In Luke, 
Jesus Christ is at the center of God's purposes from his birth to his ministry in Israel and finally his death, resurrection, commissioning of disciples and ascension to cosmic lordship. In Acts, he is called the Lord Jesus 18 times and he is seated at the right hand of God and is Lord, and it is by His Holy Spirit that He continues to minister uh, the ministry of salvation. Unquote. And I wanted to read a couple of those scriptures that it's referring to. Acts two thirty three. Now He is exalted to the place of highest honor in heaven, at God's right hand, and the Father, as He had promised, gave Him the Holy Spirit to pour out on us, just as you see and hear today. Acts five thirty one. Then God put him in the place of honor at his right hand as prince and savior. He did this so the people of Israel would repent of their sins and be forgiven. Acts 10.36 This is the message of good news for the people of Israel, that there is peace with God through Jesus Christ, who is Lord of all. Scripture after Scripture after Scripture describes to us how Jesus is Lord. And not just Lord of this or that, but Lord of everything. Lord of all. As we start to wind things up, I want to take a quick look at Philippians 2, uh, 5 through uh, 11. And it says this. It says, You must have the same attitude that Christ Jesus had. Though he was God, he did not think of equality with God as something to cling to. Instead, he gave up his divine privileges. He took the humble position of a slave and was born as a human being. When he appeared in human form, he humbled himself in obedience to God and died a criminal's death on the cross. Therefore, God elevated him to the place of highest honor and gave him the name above all other names that the name of Jesus every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue declare that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. If Jesus himself humbled himself, took on skin, died a, a criminal's death, became a slave, became a servant, he's called the servant of all. Jesus did that. Jesus humbled himself. He gave up his privileges, his divinity. He gave that up. How much more should we be willing to give up this kingdom of dirt we have acquired? If Christ himself, who is Lord of all, was willing to come down, to humble himself, we should have no trouble bending the knee to the Lord of all. One last quote from author Bruce Ashford. Quote, If Christ is Lord, he is Lord over our work and our leisure, our families and friendships, our, going, our goings on inside the four walls of the church building and outside those walls. He is not just the Lord over certain religious things, but Lord over art, science, politics, economics, education, and homemaking. Jesus Christ is relevant to every dimension of society and culture. And for this reason, we should allow our Christianity to shape absolutely everything we do. Just as a last reminder, our walk with Jesus is not simply a personal spiritual feeling. It's not just about warm fuzzies that we get on Sunday morning. Rather, it should reflect, uh, it, should, it should influence and impact every aspect of our life and the ethic by which we live out every single day of our life. Here's our challenge. Take this with you. Do not limit your walk with Jesus to certain parts of your life. Don't hold back, but make him Lord of every part of your life. 
That should be our, our, our prayer and that should be what we strive for every day is to serve the Lord of all in every way possible. Let's pray. Lord God, I thank you so much uh, once again for this opportunity to come, to lift up your name, to sing your praises, to worship you, to truly humble ourselves, to, to lay it all down before you as our Lord, Lord of everything, Lord of all. And I just pray as we continue to go back into a time of, of song, I pray, Lord God, that we will truly cry out uh, from our hearts and sing the songs and, and uh, acknowledge your lordship over our lives. We love you so much. You're an amazing God. We put our faith and trust in you. In Jesus' precious name, amen.